Hello everyone and welcome to a very in-depth review of the Anbernic Arc. Please use the timestamps in this video to guide you through it. Those are sort of my headings in these very in-depth videos. Also, I have a bunch of links in the description below with things that I'm gonna mention throughout this video, so check it out. Also, my website's got some information that's gonna help you get this thing set up nicely. So let's get into it. So the first thing I wanna mention is that I did a little comparison, just an interesting comparison. I made a spreadsheet of Sega sales versus Nintendo sales throughout their lifespan, because eventually they died. Because for a lot of us, Sega was like the big thing, and it's very interesting to see how poorly they did compared to Nintendo. Anyway, so check out that spreadsheet. All right, so I did a first impressions view uh, video, and a lot of that stuff will be valid still, even though I've had this now for quite some time, nearly a month. And the first thing that you'll notice with this device is that it's super chunky, and that's one of the things that I like and continue to like about this device. It's very big and will do a beloved crotch time where I test the pocketability of this. But just to say, it isn't pocketable, um, but it does make it very nice to hold in the hand. For instance, the sort of wraparound effect you get with the shoulder buttons is really nice. And the, the buttons overall are really, really good. You've got the circular D-pad, so how it works is it's got a you know, little um, rubber membrane switch at each trigger point, you know, like each top, down, left, right. Uh, but then it's running on a, a pivot, like a center point. And so you roll it over those buttons, which makes it exceptional for fighting games. And then you've got the start and select, which are just plastic, sort of soft press um, rubber membranes. I did mention that the plastic is a little bit cheaper compared to our usual Anvenic excellence quality that we're used to. So for instance, if you take the, the RG353P, it feels a lot more solid, like hollow and, and plasticky. So um, there definitely is a difference there. But where the similarities come in is these shoulder buttons. These are some of the nicest non-analog shoulder buttons I've tried on a device, and they've carried that through to this. Uh, which incidentally, if you pair this to your computer, I think it is, somewhere where I paired it, I think it was to the Wi-Fi or something, and this registers as a RG353P. So um, there's a lot of elements that I think have been brought over from this to this. Personally, I think the D-pad on this device is better than this. Um, obviously, it doesn't have analog sticks, bit of a letdown. This also has HDMI just out, just like the 353P had, which Anbenek have been stingy with over the, the last year or two. Also, a two SD card setup. Headphone jack on Linux, you're not gonna get a, um, Bluetooth headphones. The one weird thing with this is that the function button, like on this, on this device, you've got the function button here, which is handy. The function button is here which the more I use it, the more it annoys me. So that is a downside. And then lastly, just a quick body run through all these buttons. You'll see these buttons do look like they get a lot of trouble, but if you look at how I press it, that's not a huge amount of travel. And if you listen to the sound, it's a very satisfying dull click that you get with these buttons. And so overall, I just wanna say my verdict is that these are some of the nicest retro buttons. And unfortunately, I don't have anything to compare it to in terms of just the, you know, the Segas of the olden days, but um, I think it's damn near close and if not better, you know, with modern technology and plastics and all that, these buttons are really cool. And the D-pad, and then one last little thing, they've started to mold the interior of cases um, and so um, you get a nice fitted case. Well, you have to buy it extra, but uh, the case is really, really cool. It's got an Anbenic logo on it, a little handle, nice fabric. It really feels like, you know, maybe not quite on the level of someone like TomTok or whatever, like a dedicated case brand, but it is pretty good. Okay. And then I must, you, we're gonna get into audio just now, but we do have front-facing speakers. I love front-facing speakers. They are the future, they are the answer, they are the reason for us breathing and living and having our being. And so I really like the fact that that is there. They aren't the greatest speakers, which we'll see just now. And then just the feeling in hand, man, really feels good. Okay, moving on. And then sometimes in these videos, I like to mention what I wanna call critical issues. Um, this device doesn't really suffer from anything critical. It has Wi-Fi interference. 
So um, headphones and on the speakers, you'll hear some Wi-Fi interference, that's sort of like digital noise. Um, some people might be a deal breaker, but uh, not for me. Then on the firmware side, with the Android build, we don't have Play Store, which limits the way that you can use the Android. For instance, if you've paid for some apps, you might have difficulty getting them, um, which we'll look into just now. And then on the Linux side, there's no over the air updates and something else. And no artwork scraping. I, I did mention in my previous video, but I made a comment and pinned it just to make sure people know there isn't artwork scraping on the Linux side. Not such a big deal if you get it with a games card, but if you start fiddling around, it is a bit of a pain. And then obviously with the setup, there are no add-in log sticks, you know? And that does cause problems. So on certain games, you are limited, but we're gonna get into a very extensive game test and you'll see that there are plenty of games. And in fact, some games are actually expanded and made more pleasurable because of the three button setup. On the hardware side, we have an RK3566 chipset. I don't even always talk about the chipsets in these because I like to just talk about the experience, what it can do and all that. I just wanna mention it because if you are looking at this, just look up the RK3566 chipset. There are plenty of gameplay videos out there. So my gameplay is gonna be more focused on the experience with these buttons and how, how many games are sort of broken because of it and how many games play and all that sort of thing. That's what I'm gonna focus on. But the RK3566 chipset is a good chipset and it makes it a bit cheaper than something like the Anbrinic RG405E or the 405M or you know something with a similar screen. So what you'll get out of this chipset, you'll definitely be able to play PS1, N64, not the entire catalog and with these this button layout, you're really gonna struggle with button mapping and that, but you know, some games will play on N64. Dreamcast, as you'll see later, you can play a huge portion of the Dreamcast library. Then Sega Saturn, again, very limited, but surprisingly quite a few games that are working and that work very well with the three button layout. But then what you really wanna get this for is for Mega Drive, Sega Genesis. If you set this up purely for those games and have everything else as a bonus, this is going to be just the ultimate device for you. So if you are a Mega Drive, fan, just buy this thing. You are absolutely going to love it. And that's one of the things I think Adminic are very clever with is for collectors to set this up for dedicated gameplay. It really is something special. And then the famous shake test. Ooh, I don't think I've actually done it until this very moment. It's pretty rattly, but, but on Adminic standards, let's look at the way more expensive RG405M. I love to do this. That's ridiculous on such an expensive device. It just shows me that it's actually inside, even though it feels cheaper, it's actually quite well put together. And that is a good thing. Um, it feels well put together. Maybe we'll do a tear down at the end, let's see. Okay, so I've got my remote control for my, my lights and we are going to do a screen test. Now, firstly, brightness, you've got to go all the way into system settings. I can't find a shortcut for brightness. We are currently at the lowest. And the fact that you can see the screen in my studio with the camera settings is concerning. So we're we'll gonna switch the lights off now, we're at 9%. So let's go at full brightness. So there it's clipping on my camera. Um, so it's very bright. So I would say this is decent enough for outdoor gameplay. Um, but now let's go all the way down to the bottom. That is, that is dimmer now that I've got it to zero, but let's switch this off. Now, in my studio, as I sit here, I'm just glad I've been using this for a while on a decent test because this looks dim, but it actually isn't. It is quite bright when you're sitting in a completely dark room at night because there is actually still a fair amount of light leaking into this room. Let's quickly do it in Android just to do a quick safety check. We're all the way to its brightest. So that's about the same as the Linux. Um, it's also clipping on my camera. And then we go, so that's about the same as the Linux. Uh, and I can say from experience using this in bed at night, it is fairly bright. So the first thing to note with this comparison is that I have now set this screen. So if I quickly swipe here, that's where the setting is on the brightness of the screen. This device is set to 9%. This is at about, what, like two thirds. There's definitely a calibre. Okay, this is a little bit dimmer. So let, let's go even brighter. So maybe three quarters. So now we've matched the brightness. So there's not a, uh, there's a bit of a calibration issue here. Maybe with custom firmware, we'll get a better calibration of the screen on this device. 
But that's not really what I want to talk about. What I wanted to focus on is the color. Like if you look at that, that's so similar. Like look at those screens. Uh, I can't see a difference. So I do think we've got the same screen in these two devices. Okay, so we're gonna do the pockets ability test. And uh, we've got the, this thing, which is just massive. Like that is just a huge bulge. That's what she said. And then, uh, you know what? It's not pocketable. I'm not gonna compare it. To, uh, like even the RG353P is more pocketable than this. So it really is not. Let's quickly do the, the Retro Pocket 3 Plus. Way more pocketable just because it's skinny and long. That's what she said. And then my build quality rating out of five, I would say this is about a 3.5. The reason for that is the slight plasticiness to it and it does rattle a little bit. That's the only reason. Okay, so now we're gonna do an audio test. I'll take the audio processing off now. Sega! Sega! I'm hoping that you'll notice the difference there, but I'll explain it to you in case it doesn't come across on YouTube, is that the sound on here is just more muffled. And up until this point, I've been kind of of the opinion that it doesn't matter how good the speakers are, they're retro games, it's 16-bit games, who really cares? But the audio on the RP2S is just far superior to this. So this feels boxy. It's not something that you're gonna notice if it's the only thing you're playing. And then in terms of power management, uh, the sleep test, I have noticed overnight, I'll be lose between four, three, well, three to six percent overnight, which is not fantastic, but it's also not awful. I'll also put on the screen my battery life test. I'm gonna put it on 100%. And unfortunately I can't do my Actually, I might be able to do my elastic thing where I make a character walk around in a circle. I might just game with it for six hours straight, but Ambernick recommend that it's six hours. So then ergonomics and design, the sort of retro echo to the Sa Sega Saturn, and this is actually a copy of version two of the Mega Drive Genesis controller. So that's what it actually is copying. And that retro echo is just so good. So obviously, because now it is bigger, we lose pockets ability, but it really is worth it, you know, just get a bag, a, get a case for it and throw it in your backpack because what you get is this wraparound effect, which is really nice. And I showed in my previous video how I played Loco Roco, which is where you use these two buttons mostly to rock the screen from side to side. And it, it feels so good. And you'll also see in my, my racing test um, of Dreamcast games where Dreamcast uses the shoulder buttons to accelerate and brake. It doesn't always feel natural on these retro emulators. On this device, it does feel quite natural. So there you get that benefit. You get the, the, the finger grips at the back, which is something that they, they learned in, on the RG405V. And you've got this bulge at the bottom, which allows it to just be so grippable. Um, and the reason why the Sega Genesis controllers were so nice to use. I mean, in terms of devices that I own, I've got the I've got the RG four hundred five V, which is a, also a nice big device and like very grippable. So that's got a really nice vertical hold. But this is definitely better ergonomically. And the biggest, most ergonomic device I own currently is the PowerKitty X twenty eight, but it doesn't have massive grips. I'd actually say that the closest competitor is the X fifty five. The X fifty five's got such a good grip. <laughs> it's definitely better. So in the retro gaming space, this is probably the most ergonomic retro gaming device in the world. So in terms of connectivity, as I've mentioned, you do get Wi-Fi interference on this device. Not the end of the world, not the worst that I've seen, but it is there. You've got Bluetooth connectivity, both on the Android and Linux side in terms of controllers, like Bluetooth controllers. It's got an OTG port for wired controllers so what you could do is use this as your controller plug it via hdmi into a screen 
and then plug another controller in and do two players, which it is a fighting game device. And you could just do Bluetooth. You could do a bunch of Bluetooth controllers on here and it will work. And then as I have mentioned before, you don't get audio uh, to Bluetooth headphones on the Linux side, but you do on the Android side. Okay, so in order to pair a Bluetooth controller, you're gonna get your Bluetooth controller into pair mode. And then you wanna go into the menu. You wanna go to controller settings. Um, go to Bluetooth controller and say pair a Bluetooth controller. This should automatically, sometimes it's like, yeah, I just have to press the button for it to kind of acknowledge that it exists. So once we're there, we should be able to start navigating. Um, so that's fine. So now we Bluetooth enabled. Now this is a little bit tricky. So it says it pick, picks up two pad, game pads. It means the game pad on the device and my gamepad. So now it says press hold A button. Now it knows I'm trying to configure this device, which will become important now. Down, left, right, start, select, A, B, X, Y. Now we don't have an analog stick on this tiny controller, so over here I'm gonna use this and it doesn't affect my mapping in any way. L1, R1, and I'm gonna use select as my hotkey. Say okay. All right, now an important aspect, it took me a while to figure this one out. You need to set player one, player two. This is awesome because if you have multiple Bluetooth controllers or wired controllers, you can set them all here. This is a really cool feature that Anbernic have instituted. Over here, we can go there and we can select this as player two or um, the other way around. So for this instance, I want my Bluetooth controller to be player one. So now, what if this is player one, it means that this is my console and this is my controller. Really cool, and I haven't seen this instituted this well in anything else, so, so really well done to Anbernek on that. Now, to iterate, this is usually quite a mission to set up, and so it's something that I usually avoid in these videos because it's not super user-friendly and super easy to do, and so I don't focus on it. But with this device, it really is a very consolable, <laughs> consolable, whatever device. Even though I was considering putting Gamma OS on here, um, this feature would keep me on the Anbernic Linux until I'm happy that one of the other Linux Institute as well, because um, this is, you know, what I said in my other video is if you can have this with the HDMI out outports and a couple of Bluetooth controllers, it's such a cool retro feeling and have it as your Mega Drive console um, attached to your TV, it would really be cool. That's probably what I'm gonna do with this. Anyway, okay, let's play a game. And so, I mean, this little controller isn't the best in the world, but it's, I mean, it's pretty cool. So one of the things I wanted to say to you was whether the audio comes out of here or out of the TV, and you can actually choose HDMI or headphones slash speaker. So you can choose where the audio comes out of. So Anbernic have really put a bit of thought into this. And again, I don't want to harp on about this because I've seen demos of this working. So it might be something wrong in my studio, but um, they have put a lot of thought into the multiplayer feature in the Linux system. So the initial setup experience, I, I, I don't know if I'm just getting used to these devices, but the setup Pretty much, especially with the games card, which, you know, we have these debates, it's it's sketchy and all that kind of stuff to ship these with games. But with the games card, it's quite easy to get going. So on the Android side, you just swipe down, you press the little game logo, and it will launch into their launcher. And that will allow you to pretty much play everything. It's all, whoops, it's all ready to roll. All the games are there, and I checked the systems most of them just work straight off the bat. Linux is even easier because it's already set up for you. There are downsides to that, which we'll discuss in the gameplay section. And then I did have to make a change. So, you know, this is specifically designed for Mega Drive gaming. And I had to go into the Mega Drive. They use the, the MD emulator, which I think is actually an older emulator. Go to the console options, input ports, I had to go to auto and I needed to turn on six button gamepad. But for some reason that wasn't on and so I wasn't getting the full six button experience. It's supposed to auto select, but it just didn't. Um, that might be fixed in an update. We'll see what happens there. So what you can do is specifically in the PPSSPP emulator is you can hack the settings work for a specific game because the PSP had an analog stick, a D-pad, and then four buttons on the right. And so you can hack it by saying, t t telling the emulator that Z is up for the D-pad, C is down for the D-pad, and L2 is left for the D-pad, 
and R2 is right for the D-pad and then use this as your directional analog stick. Like for instance, Assassin's Creed used the D-pad for certain functions. Um, so having these buttons um, mapped to that won't really feel weird. It'll just be something to get used to. And then this will be your directional control the character. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the Android specific issues, problems, good things, bad things. First thing to note is that this doesn't have the Google Play Store. I don't really like a lot of the apps that they pre-install. For example, I don't even know if it had an app store when it opened up. And you will immediately, when you start getting into this, want certain apps. The one positive thing about not having Google Play services is that you do get arguably better performance because uh, Google Play kind of works around in the back end. Chrome famously uses a lot of RAM. Um, and so not having those services will improve performance to a degree. I am considering straight after this video, video putting Gamma OS on it and taking it with me on holiday as my gaming device because um, I think Gamma OS is gonna make this really, really nice. And then the other pretty big downside of not having Google Play services is if you won't be able to play a lot of Android games. A lot of Android games are kind of built into that ecosystem and you won't be able to get them. I think I tried to get my version of Dead Cells on you and just couldn't get it loaded. Maybe there's a way I couldn't get it going. And in my sort of show notes on my websites, I will put links to Gamma OS, the Retro Arena, all that stuff, so that you can have a look at that and see if that's something that you wanna do. And then regarding the Linux build, it is An Anbinic's best Linux build to date, but we'll speak about some of, the, some of the shortcomings now. It sort of lends itself, sort of in terms of the look and feel from Garlic OS, which is nice, Garlic OS and Onion OS, it's got that sort of simplistic look, which is really cool, and that's why I do, want to recommend this to most users because it is the simplest and easiest to get going. So you'll see here yeah, we've got emulators and retroarch and that's the way that they've organized the games, which, which is weird. I, I think it should have just been one section and then within there all the, you know, the systems. But anyway, so you've got emulators um, and it does get confusing because you've got the standalone emulator for Sega Dreamcast. So anything using a standalone emulator, what I mean is not retroarch is here. Then anything using RetroArch, if you don't know what RetroArch is, it's a sort of all-in-one emulator system. It does most of the older systems, everything from PS1 down, you can just use RetroArch. Here, if you go in here, there's, it tries to emulate Dreamcast via RetroArch as well. So for anyone who's new to the hobby, that's gonna be quite confusing. And then some of the other issues. So uh, I feel bad in my other video, I did pin a comment on that video, but I said that you can do scraping because I was like, oh look, network settings. So sign into your Wi-Fi, and then you can do your artwork scraping. But there is no artwork scraping here. What's usually here is the over the air update. So there's no over the air updates either. They've gone through all this effort to make this user friendly and then you can't do an over the air update. And then one of the things, if you are once, because I've done an extensive test of Dreamcast games and I did it in the Linux section and I got a lot of Dreamcast games working, but some of the controls on Dreamcast, because of the way that we, Dreamcast controller was, some of the controls are broken on here. For instance, depending on where your directional controls are set, if they aren't set to the D-pad and actually to a joystick, you're not gonna be able to move your character around. So one thing I have noticed is that in, um, in N64, there's no way of exiting the game. So here, unfortunately, the, the function button um, doesn't seem to work. It doesn't seem to do anything. If I press and hold, it doesn't go out of the game. The only way to go out of the game is to press and hold the power button and then it exits. So here I'm in Sega Saturn and one of the little quirks now, so like I say, Anbinic are getting close to a unified system, but if you press the function button, nothing works. The select button brings up the menu. So it'd be nice if they could get that working, you know. But what I do like about the Sega Saturn emulator, I think this is a Linux version of Yabasan Shiro. It does have save states, so that's pretty cool. So I just wanna quickly give you a guide because I do think there might be some more updates coming from Anbinic and it isn't an over the air update. So I just wanna give you this information. I've included this on my show notes on my website. Download the link, there's a link to the, the download from Anbinic. Usually you have to copy and paste that link and then download. 
I don't know why Unbinic do it that way. Then extract the file using 7-zip. I've provided a link to 7-zip. Burn the ISO file to your SD card using Win32 disk disk imager. Belina Etcher doesn't work, so do not use Belina Etcher. I've provided a link to Win32. Also for Mac users, I think Raspberry Pi imager will work for you, so just give that a go. Um, make sure your ROM's SD card is in TF2, so make sure you put it in the correct slot on your device. Power off your device and then set the, the SD card, the, the OS SD card to TF1 and then power on the device. You'll see an update script, press B for English and A for Chinese, your device will restart. Uh, then press start, game settings, update games lists, you know, within the menu of the system. And then you're all set, you'll see there's some new features. Okay, and then the next thing, little setup thing I want to show you is how to prepare Saturn ROMs or any CD system ROMs. Anything that's in a .bin and .q file, is download chdman, I've provided the link. Uncompress the chdman zip file to somewhere like your documents folder, somewhere on your computer, because you actually use that folder with chdman in the folder. But then keep the zip file somewhere because the chances of you accidentally de deleting the chdman system files is quite high. Drag your bin and q files of your different games over into the folder. You can just drag them all as you please. Then you go to the q-gdi-iso to chd.bat file. Just double click on it and chdman will run and it will turn all your bin and q files to .chd, so it'll be a single file and it will be smaller. Move your new uh, chd files to a safe place, delete the bin and q files from your chd man folder, make sure to not to delete the chd man system files, and then put those chd files onto your device as ROMs and you're off to the races. So that's how to simplify CD system ROMs and to compress them into a smaller format. Okay, so this video is getting really, really long. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show a little bit of gameplay footage here. In my show notes, you can go check for a specific game. I, I tested quite a lot of Dreamcast and Sega Saturn games. On the Dreamcast side, as I mentioned before, the controls are broken in a lot of games. Uh, games like Echo the Dolphin, the controls didn't work. Magforce Race, Racing, the controls didn't work. NBA 2K and 2K2, just performance-wise, I wouldn't recommend it. Sega Rally 2, massive audio stutter, just doesn't play. Unfortunately for Sonic Adventure 2, the D-pad wasn't mapped correctly. Same for Sonic Adventure, just one, also the same thing. And as mentioned, in Android, you'll get more flexibility on the side. So if you wanna pay more, rather go with Android and you'll get flexibility on the Dreamcast side. And, and go check out my list because it is surprising how many Dreamcast games actually play. And I've just been testing the RG353P, which is the one that this device is modeled on, also an Anbernic device, and the, it way outperforms the RG353P. So it's definitely a software thing, and uh, Anbernic have done really well in terms of that. Sega Saturn, now there's not a huge Sega Saturn library, it's not a super successful system, but there are some really nice games. Astol is a beautiful platformer, which I can highly recommend and plays very well. And you can go check out my list. I tested 25 Sega Saturn games and actually most of them played. So, you know, that's great. Okay, so RKA3566 devices, PowerKitty has brought out a bunch of them. Um, obviously this is a copy of the RG353P. Comparing this to the RG353P, there is now Gamma OS available for that device, which does improve it a lot. But in setting it up for my friend, I do feel that this is a better quality device, better built device, the buttons feel better, the D-pad is better, it just doesn't have joysticks. So there is that, and it's got a bigger screen. So fantastic device for the price, especially if you go for the Linux version. Uh, the Palky Kitty X55 has got a huge screen. Controls are a bit sketchy. Um, I really like it because it's super ergonomic, but at the end of the day, I think it's between these two so, sort of price and performance and the fact they're both niche devices. You know, this one doesn't have joysticks, this one has a square screen, makes them very unique in the market. I think price versus everything, like the, the Power Kitty is actually not that badly made for Power Kitty. I think firmware, this came shipped with Jealous. I don't think you're gonna ever want anything more than that. 
This device, I think we're gonna get a lot of firmware options. So if you enjoy that sort of thing, I think you're gonna get that with this device moving forward. Obviously you get Android and Linux. I think a Linux version is better here and you get more man value for money that way. And I think we're gonna get a really good Linux version in the near future. And it's it's a great place to be, 2024. This is the first time I've reached the end of the video and I honestly can't recommend one over the other. Both these devices are fantastic. Just depends what you want.